We're taking this, 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 we're That is, we'll be trying to ask sensible, clinically relevant questions to provide you, our dear audience, with sensible, clinically relevant answers. My name is Andres Kobernet, and you're listening to A Pinch of Salt, a new ERA podcast series. It is an honor and a privilege to have as our guest today Dr. Yarne Payek, who is a well-known expert in the field of peritoneal dialysis and vascular access. Yarne, welcome to A Pinch of Salt. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so before we start with the questions, we'll just have to do the full disclosure, which in our case will be slightly different from the norm. The full disclosure is that uh, we're actually not strangers. We know each other for a long time. Uh, we're both from the same country. We both work in the same hospital. Uh, yeah. When I came to the department, uh, you were, I think, in your fourth or fifth year of residency. Um, so for, yeah. for me, you were the guy who knew everything I wanted to know. <laughs> and I was lucky enough that you were willing to share. So I know all of your career path, and that's really the reason why I asked you to join us here today, um, because I know that you're passionate about dialysis access, and um, that's what we'll be talking about. So in the beginning, you were actually a doctor that spent most of, this most of his time at the ward. So I remember you were very into, you know, all of the classic ward stuff, anchor vasculitis, lupus yeah. nephritis, immune suppression. You're very passionate about that. But that, and so at some point, uh, you went into dialysis access. Now, maybe we have to say that in our hospital in Ljubljana, we have a long history um, uh, in dialysis access actually being created by nephrologists. So yeah. our teachers have started that decades ago. So it was a fertile ground to go into dialysis access but what what made you decide to go into that did you did you thought about being a surgeon before you entered nephrology or was it just did you just come to the idea later on yeah it was one of the reasons or one of the facilitary uh, facil facilitating factors was that i actually thought a lot about uh, taking up surgery before going into internal medicine and nephrology that that was a facilitation Uh, circumstance but um, actually I just started with a lot of um, ultrasound mm -hmm. so th that was the first thing that I that I did that was perhaps not so common for every nephrologist and it was basically uh, echocardiography so I started with echocardiography to better manage my patients on the ward mm -hmm. patients in general moved on to kidney ultrasound Doppler and kidney biopsies. And doing that, after a few years, I got the opportunity to actually take on the spot as an assistant to an established uh, professor in our unit who was actually an expert in dialysis access, in vascular access that was. And uh, I, did, uh, I, did, uh, I, I assisted him for one year. He retired after that, and it was either go on, do it on yourself, or just, you know, revert to basic nephrology, and I decided to go on. It was a, it was a very stressful uh, time, stressful mm. period, mm. but it was rewarding. So, so that, you had a lot of support in that first year, I imagine. So you went through the most difficult part of the learning curve, I guess. But after one year, you're probably not completely competent in every possible aspect of no. vascular access, I no. imagine. No, no. So actually, my first fistula that I did uh, was actually early failure. Mm -hmm. So the, the first fistula that, that we did together, that I did as an operator, and he and my teacher as an assistant was, was a failure. I suspect that's quite common, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> well, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. It was just a matter of coincidence. But, uh, you know, it's important when, when you're on a starting part of a learning curve that you do not lose motivation. Yeah, yeah. For you, sure. you need to You need to improve yourself and you need, you need to keep going. 
So was it daunting to keep going without your mentor, or did you have did you get another mentor, or um, did you just do it all by yourself? Well, I was very lucky to get some help from a senior colleague uh, that was still present and is still present in the unit, and mm -hmm. he was assisting me. And you know, uh, in one of your previous podcasts, uh, uh, I think it, it was it was very important thing that you have a mentor in nephrology. Yeah, and that I, was. I, I would say so, I would say so. This is also important in 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 dialysis access as well. We talked about that. Uh, Christoph Vonner, our president, yeah. ERA president, mentioned that. Yeah, uh, we'll talk about that in the end as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I joined your dialysis unit uh, at the end of last year, and um, we we sat down and had a cup of coffee before I, I came to your ward your dialysis unit and you said you'll see that mostly what we do here is we we take care of fistulas yeah <laughs> that's mostly what you do would you like to expand on that why do you think fistulas are so important you know it's um it's a funny thing because there is a perception that um treating people on chronic hemodialysis is not that demanding i mean you you have to solve all sorts of issues mm -hmm. with these patients that are that are not really strictly nephrology, and uh, otherwise, you know, the field of hemodialysis really advanced in the last couple of decades, and uh, also uh, recently by getting evidence on hemodia filtration and uh, new membranes are coming, and we are able to actually dialyze our patients really well. You know, mm. if the patient is compliant, you're able to be really well dialyzed. And of course, if the comorbidities, comorbidities are not too heavy. Mm. This thing ends immediately when you step into the field of the vascular access. Because for sure, in your dialysis center, every day there will be a patient with a dialysis access problem. Mm -hmm. And since I always wanted to do all that I can for my patients, I also thought that just solving these issues is very important for me to be, you know, to to even uh, to even look at myself as a let's say uh, good nephrologist. So this this was this was a part that really motivated me also, because yeah. the, the hemodialysis field really gets difficult when you step into the dialysis access. Because a good dialysis access can mean a difference of several years as compared maybe yeah. to, to a catheter. Or, um... and, and I think w one of the things that you as a nephrologist need to do is that when you accept a new patient into your hemodialysis ward, you need to ask yourself, is this current dialysis axis an axis that, is, uh, that, that will be available and will be functional for the whole life plan of this particular patient? Mm -hmm. So you, you you need to have you need to have always when you think about the dialysis access, except in most frail and old patients, where basically you could also be satisfied with a good central venous catheter. In all uh, in all other instances, it is good not to only look at the current access, but also look at the ne next step. Mm -hmm. Is there anything for us there available if this particular access fails? Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to have this in each patient. And I think it's also important that you know the dialysis accesses of your patients. Now, many nephrologists just, you know, look at their fistula. Okay, the fistula is there. Can we needle it? Okay, we can needle it. Let's go. Mm -hmm. But I think that for the success of the dialysis therapy as such, you need to know the dialysis, uh, the vascular accesses of your patients. You need to know how what is the probability that the access will fail in this particular patient? And how well it's functioning in the first place, I guess. And how well it's functioning. And the the echo, the ultrasound is crucial here. I, I guess, would you agree that you cannot be focused on vascular access without ultrasound? That you cannot be a competent, let's say, vascular surgeon or somebody who takes care of fistulas without doing the, the ultrasound? Of course. And there are, many, there are many surgeons who actually like to do their... A vascular mapping prior to uh, access surgery by themselves. Mm. I think it's the right way to go. And I often get questions from many units who would like to 
uh, increase their involvement in the vascular access and they say, okay, how can we do this? What mm -hmm. is the first step? The first step is that you have practitioners who are able to do ultrasound well and by ultrasound, I mean not only mapping for de novo accesses, mm -hmm. but also uh, surveillance of the vascular access uh, to be really able to solve the uh, question, what is wrong with a particular access? Mm -hmm. And I think that ultrasound and Doppler is the crucial tool here. And once you manage this part of the field well, you're able to move well equipped to the next part to basically do the accesses. Mm -hmm. So would you would you argue would you advocate that um, nephrologists should be the ones that primary deal with dialysis access, creating fistulas, inserting grafts, tunnel catheters? Because we know that in different places around the world, the 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 norm, the tradition, is different. Sometimes vascular surgeons do this. Sometimes other surgeons, and obviously anybody who's a capable surgeon can probably. A vascular surgeon at least could probably do this easily but I guess the question that we often ask ourselves is what is the motivation for somebody who really doesn't take care of dialysis patients otherwise who doesn't see all the problems of a failed access or failed fistula is the motivation the same is the passion to take care of these things the way they should be the same well uh to answer your first question, yes, I think that the nephrologist should be the key uh, person who takes care of the access. Uh, why? Just because of a simple fact that, in my opinion, this is the best possible solution for our patients mm -hmm. in terms of safety, in terms of uh, appropriate access for each and every patient, in terms of uh, being able to uh, to predict probably what is the life plan, what kind of access is okay, what kind of access is not okay. Um, and uh, yes, I think that um, I think that also the international community, the, the international nephrology community, should accept this more widely and also support this program to develop more widely. Because mm -hmm. we talked about, you mentioned that one of your. The way you envision nephrology continuing in the future is that it might turn into a field, at least for some nephrologists, obviously not every nephrologist would deal with, will be a surgeon for sure, yeah. but at least for a, a part of nephrology, it will become something similar to gynecology or ENT, yeah. Yeah. like a, a field that is a bit surgery, a bit everything else, yeah. I guess. I, I firmly believe that that is the right way to go. Mm. I think that the, the vision, that the nephrology specialty is the specialty which enables people not only to monitor and uh, uh, do proper surveillance of the excesses but also create excesses is the right way to go i think it's motivating for our residents it would be motivating for our res residents and as i mentioned previously a tremendous benefit for our patients mm -hmm. now if you had a very good situation context to start working in vascular access because we had the tradition, we had the teachers, we had yeah. our professors. Uh, PD catheters was a different thing because now you're inserting PD catheters as well. Yeah. Uh, could you explain why you went into this? Because this, I guess if you're starting from zero, this is quite a daunting task. I mean, you can puncture a, a, the bowel or whatever. It's not. It's not. It doesn't seem like an easy thing to do. But you still went into it. Could you explain why and and how you did it? Yeah. Well, the motivation was twofold. First, um, there were a lot of. I mean, we we do have a good a good dedicated surgeon for our PD access, mm -hmm. but. Uh, at the time, we, this is only one surgeon, mm -hmm. and if he's away, we are always in, in a bit of a trouble. That's it, yeah. And there were also a lot of logistic problems and logistic issues that we always have to solve when we try to put a PD catheter in a patient. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, coordinating two specialties is always a challenge, and every nephrologist knows this, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second thing is that uh, basically... A lot of studies, there, there's a number of studies out there saying that if you are able to provide your own peritoneal access, 
this will help your PD program to grow. Mm -hmm. And I would like to be very, very honest here. We, we do not want the PD programs to grow to grow just for the sake of the growth. Just for the number. Just for the number. Mm. But we would primarily like them to grow because of the realization that not all patients who would benefit from PD actually get to PD in the current situation in many, many units. And this was also the situation in our unit. Mm -hmm. So th there were two motivations, to get rid of the logistic barriers mm -hmm. and also to uh, increase the uptake of PD for patients who would benefit from PD. But uh, it is also very, very much important that you have to know that being able to have a dedicated abdominal surgeon who is able to do laparoscopy and advanced laparoscopic insertion and to help you solve the complications that need to be solved by using surgery and laparoscopy is very, very important for the success of a PD program. Yeah. And we were very honest right from the beginning and we presented our motivation and our plan and our vision to our surgeon with a very clear idea. We do not want to take over your job, mm -hmm. but we would like to manage that part of the patients which, which are more simple, where we are still able to put the peritoneal access in them safely mm -hmm. and efficiently yep. and getting rid of all the logistic barriers and also getting rid of the workload that our surgical friend really doesn't need mm -hmm. because his services are best used when he's basically called to solve more advanced surgical problems. So basically what you're saying is that you were able to go into this field because you had full support from the abdominal surgeons. Oh yeah, I, I, I think it's uh, this is one crucial idea that, that is true not only in peritoneal dialysis but also in vascular access. Mm -hmm. If you want to set up uh, the service of placing the dialysis access, either vascular or peritoneal, and there is no tradition and there, there is no experience in your unit, mm -hmm. the most efficient way is to get the early buy-in and to get the training and tutorship from your surgical colleagues. Mm. This is the most efficient way. Probably the only one, I guess. Well, maybe. Th th there are people who really do not talk a lot with their own surgeons in their hospitals, and they are asking around, is there somebody from nephrology world who would teach me, mm -hmm. who would tutor me to do the access? This is perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. It's always, you know, we as nephrologists, the understanding is a little bit better between yeah, yeah. us. We you know, know we, our we, talk. We, <laughs> we know we, we know what we're talking about. Yeah, right? We know our diseases, right? We know our diseases, yeah. So that, that's, that, that, it's always easier to talk and to and to work with someone who is a nephrologist. Yes, yes. But to be able to really successfully set up a program of interventional nephrology in your unit, you need, you need the cooperation from a, surgical, uh, from a surgical specialist. And here I mean vascular surgery and abdominal surgery. Yeah. So you, you referenced before the podcast with Christoph Vonner, and um, we talked about that um, uh, at the dinner that we had together the other day because I really liked what he said about what a young doctor, a nephrologist or other doctor, I suppose, but what a young doctor really needs for his or her career. Uh, and the first thing was perseverance. That is definitely the main trait, I guess, in medicine. Otherwise, you can't do anything. Then you need a mentor. I also firmly believe that. Everybody needs a mentor. Everybody needs help. Uh, it's good to be part of a group, especially if you want to do research. Uh, and the fourth thing, learn how to communicate with other people. I thought that was very good too. Yeah. But then you mentioned but a fifth thing, which I also think I agree with you, is also very important. Would you, would you explain to our viewers what you think the fifth thing is that every yeah. doctor needs, I guess? Yeah. Well, in, in my firm belief is that the fifth pillar of success is your honest internal motivation. What are you really motivated to do? What motivates you? Mm -hmm. So not in, it's not, you, you, you can be asked, okay, tell me please what motivates you. And somebody would answer, yeah, it really, it really motivates me when, when I'm successful. But that's not the right answer. Mm -hmm. You need to think about the content of your work. Mm -hmm. What content of your work really motivates you? And I'm talking about motivation 
that keeps you going in the after hours in the middle of the night in the middle of the night or to stay in the afternoon if something goes wrong and you're not really feeling bad about it and the content of work that you feel joy when you're when you do it you know yeah yeah i agree completely it's it's a type of it's a kind of a passion i would say yeah i think you need a bit of a yeah. fire to do medicine because yeah. when we talked about that i remembered a case later on which we were both involved in i don't know if you remember it but there was this very young kid boy nine or ten something like that who was at the intensive care unit pediatric intensive care unit for because of ex extreme hyperammonemia Mm -hmm. uh, and it was completely unknown. They just took him to the ER because he was feeling strange. Yeah. And then they said, we can't find anything. They sent them back and he just lost consciousness in the car. Then they brought him back. Then they saw that the, the ammonium was immeasurably high. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the person who was on call, he, he called and said, well, we have this... This child with hyperammonemia, we're gonna give we're gonna give uh, five percent glucose, and I just want you to know because you know maybe he'll need dialysis, and I know knew exactly what my what my role was, what my part was in that situation. Yeah. It was like to start dialysis as immediately as yeah. soon as possible, and I said no way, we're just we're gonna, we're starting dialysis now, five yeah. minutes ago. Take care of the dialysis access as quickly as you can. And then I had to call one of the dialysis nurses to come from home, yeah. you know, because it's a nightmare to dialyze children, you know. I mean, yeah. that's the part of the job I most hate. You want to have an experienced dialysis nurse. So we called him from home. He wasn't on call or anything. Yeah. I, I just basically said, listen, I really need you. Mm -hmm. And he came. So uh, that was also a, a part of the passion, you know. And then we sat there, both of us, through the whole night, just watching the patient, more yeah, or less. Yeah. And I didn't go to sleep because I, th I knew it was, you know, it was, it did, it, I wouldn't sleep in any case. Yeah. Uh, and then the first measurement after we started dialysis was still immeasurably high. The second was still immeasurably high. And we talked about, you know, can we have a bit more blood flow? Can we have a bit yeah, more, yeah, you know, yeah. just, just basic stuff, nothing special, but just it made so much sense just to be there through the whole night. And, um, when I finished, you came later on on call, and I know you dialyzed him for another whole day. Yeah. Just regular dialysis, 20 hours of regular dialysis. And, you know, uh, when you go home in that situation, the feeling is not, you know, my God, I didn't sleep a minute. You know, what a terrible job. Mm -hmm. It was more like I'm so happy that I had the chance to do my part, you know. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound spectacular. It wasn't spectacular, but doing mm -hmm. your part can be a very, very yeah. gratifying thing. And part of the good thing with, with the dialysis axis is that when you when you do the surgery and when the surgery is over and in a lot of cases you just know what the final outcome will be you mm. you you know you know <laughs> you, you don't need you don't as a surgeon you know, mm -hmm. you know okay and if if there is a judgment that this will be a good access mm -hmm. there is an immediate rewarding joy mm -hmm. but of course joy has to be there also while you're doing it so mm -hmm. the content of your work needs to be motivating for you and this is, yeah. let's say, the fifth important thing for yeah. success in nephrology. The journey has to be joyful, not yeah. the end result. Yeah, yeah. not only that. If, if, yeah. if you're only there for the end result, you know, no, 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 no good. You, the content of your work, not knowing the result, needs to, be, need, needs to represent joy to you. Yeah, yeah. I completely. So I guess we, we managed the, the penultimate question, which is what you would, you know, what advice would you give in one sentence to a young nephrologist, young doctor coming up into this field, difficult but uh, gratifying field, I guess the advice would then be have the passion or something of that yeah. kind. Yeah. Ask yourself, do I feel happy mm. when I treat patients with kidney disease? Exactly. That, that's it. And which doesn't necessarily mean that you'll be happy every minute of the day. <laughs> no, but am I happy with the content of my work? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So the last question is like a, it's a, it's a standard getting to know question, getting to know your question, which is, which book, luxury item, and two songs would you take to a desert island and why? Uh -huh. So it's it's a book, luxury it's a book, item, it's and luxury. two songs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, and you have to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, a book. I'm I'm not so sure. I actually wasn't doing a lot of uh, non non scientific reading in the last years, to be honest, which mm. is not a good thing. You know, the first thing that would came to my mind it's probably, 
You know, when I was young, I really enjoyed reading the Karl May books. Oh, Karl May. So I would probably, if I if I took Winnetou, I think it would be quite okay. The Westerns. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I completely understand. I'm really, <laughs> right, right now, I'm really into comic books. Yeah. <laughs> like these, these elaborate, long comic books. They, yeah. They're amazing what they do. Okay, so then so luxury item? Luxury item. If this was an island with with tarmac roads, mm-hmm. I would take Ducati Multistrada V4. Okay, that's okay. For uh, for all of you out there that there don't know no, what's a Ducati, that's a motorcycle. That's a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah. in the, in the, in, and if there are no tarmac roads, I would probably take um, BMW GS 1300. Uh, 1, I assume which that's is another form of a motorcycle, another just more, motorcycle? more appropriate for okay. a, for a gravel road. Fair enough. Okay. And two songs, right? Two songs, yeah. Well, the f- the first song for sure should be blues song. For example, I don't know. You know that Croatian band Parni Valjak? I do. I would take, uh, for example, their, their very nice blues song is Dok je tebe. Mm-hmm. So this is something that I would take. Which is something like While I Have You, I guess, would, I be, you, yeah. would be the translation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, the second song, I don't know what would be something that I would really like to listen Perhaps something from I don't know Metallica, like Whiskey in the nice. Jar or something like that. Yeah, that's a good on-call song, I think. Yeah. You know what? My favorite on-call song was when I was there at the middle of the night, yeah. all night long by Lionel <laughs> <Yeah>. Richie. <laughs> <laughs> that always, if you're in a yeah. bad mood, that will she make gives you. me catchy. <laughs> that will make you happy, yeah. or at least in a, you'll you'll be in a better mood. So, well, thank you, Annie, for joining us in a pinch of salt. We're um, very grateful that you shared all this valuable experience, um, the passion. It was nice, it was pleasant, and my pleasure as well. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us and listening to A Pinch of Salt. Please check out other episodes that are already available and stay tuned for new episodes, which will be released every second Thursday of the month. Farewell, my friends.